some activity on YouTube lately about anti-nihilism, uh, with a lot of ill-defined words being thrown out there like realism, well-being, and postmodernism. I started writing some response videos before I realized I had four of them going at the same time. So I decided to combine all four into one video called Integrity, because that is one word that applies to all of them. So what is integrity? It's not a word that is used often enough, and it has been described as doing what is right when no one is looking. But it can really be best defined as ethical consistency. It can be applied to people or to theories. Ethical consistency is the absence of contradictions, and has also been called the hallmark of an ethical life. A building without structural flaws is said to have integrity. It will bend, but not break. To fail in consistency means that one's thoughts and behaviors are irrational. The videos I am responding to here are examples of contradictory thinking. Uh, it's like if you're leaving your boss's office and he says, close the door, but leave it open. That is an irrational contradiction and it makes it impossible to know how to act. Likewise, if a vegan is pro-natalist or an anti-natalist is pro-carnist, then they are not being ethically consistent and this shows a lack of integrity. Without a solid philosophical foundation, one is more likely to make inconsistent statements and perform unethical acts. This is why integrity is so important. So when a problem arises, you will know what to do because your thinking will not be muddled with contradictions. So here are four recent examples from YouTube um, of some integrity missteps. My basic position there is that moral oughts definitely do not exist objectively. And if you think they do, you do fundamentally believe in magic. And if anyone who has a substantial social media presence, we're talking like, you know, a few thousand followers, regular views in the four digit range, wants to try to debate that with me, I will gladly expose you as being fundamentally no different than a Christian. You believe in magic. Uh, moral oughts, the notion that you should do something, that is always going to be reducible to your subjectivity. Um, so you only ought to do something if you have a particular goal in mind. If my goal is to get to the other side of the room, then I ought to get out of the chair. If my goal is to maximize well-being, then I ought not to stab someone when it's completely avoidable. But there isn't some kind of source that again would would still exist if subjectivity stopped to exist that considers things good or bad. So all of this kind of stuff, theoretical objects, concepts, systems of relations, that all in my mind exists in something that you could think of like a platonic realm. These are like, it's like an idea space. The oughts definitely do not exist objectively. There is not something beyond you that cares what you do or values actions. Superhuman Dance and others have already made video responses to this, uh, but I think it deserves some more clarification. So anti-natalists probably don't know this YouTuber, Ask Yourself. He's a young Canadian, best known as a, the moderator in some vegan gains debates. But he also likes challenging carnists to debates in his own channel and embarrassing them, which is not exactly a difficult thing to do. Uh, they have no rational argument. But he also shows a lot of animal murder on his channel, uh, so I subscribe, but I don't usually watch them because uh, I find that distasteful. You can always just link to a Mercy for Animals video. We shouldn't have to show blood and guts to make an argument, in my opinion. He didn't appear to have any particular ethical beliefs beyond boycotting animal products until he made a video recently on meta-ethics. What I witnessed was profound disappointment. Yet another nihilistic natalist that YouTube doesn't need. Superhuman Dance uh, has covered why Ask Yourself is an natalist, you know, because of the pretty colors, uh, magical future technology that will save us all from suffering, etc. So he's really a Pollyanna transhumanist with a huge optimism bias. So let me just go back to my philosophy chart here and uh, expand the part on meta-ethics to uh, figure out his point of view, even though half his video is actually about normative ethics, not meta-ethics. As I've said uh, before, I don't really care to go meta on this channel. I like to keep it as practical and simple as possible. Um, but people keep bringing this stuff up, so I feel like we have to respond to it, especially when we're talking about subjectivist ethics. So in meta-ethics, we have ethical realism and anti-realism. And under that category, which Ask Yourself identifies himself, is subjectivism and boo, nihilism. 
from his video, he seems to be, actually be more of a subjectivist uh, in that he believes value is subjective to the individual, where Nihilus believes that nothing has value. So because I only have like 160 subs um, or so, ask yourself when I debate someone as low as me uh, about this subject. Um, but this was pretty clearly a jab at Superhuman Dance, who has over a thousand subs, but his video views are mostly in the hundreds. Um, that's why he put that in there. So he refuses to debate with anyone without a thousand views average on their videos. So basically that leaves uh, Emendum and Glinos to argue with this guy, if any of them want to. I can't really call this a clever dodge, but it is a dodge, and Ask Yourself knows this will save him from having to debate someone more competent than himself on ethics. Antinatalism uh, is just not a popular philosophical position, you know, as Old Fan mentioned recently about Unnatural Vegan. She's a breeder who doesn't even understand antinatalism, but she made one of the most popular videos about the subject just because she has so many subs. I mean, we want the human race to go extinct. It's not exactly high view count material. I would say philosophy on YouTube, period, is unpopular. So well done, ask yourself. You found a way out of a debate uh, about an important topic that's above your pay grade. The only reason he even has 16,000 subs is because he's vegan gain sidekick. So the video actually doesn't start off that bad, but it gets much worse as it goes along. So to establish moral laws, a realist is likely to say something, I've, I've seen it a million times, like it's just self-evident that agony is bad. Now, that appeals to us in a human psychological way because we've evolved to feel pain and to not like negative mental states, and we've been culturally conditioned also. So, of course, to me, it's pretty fucking self-evident that agony is bad. But that's actually dodging the point. That is not establishing that there is something beyond me that cares about uh, what I do morally or considers things good or bad. If you're saying that it's self-evident and it somehow is not reducible, it's it's some uh, non-natural fact that just exists in the platonic realm, I mean, well, that's that's just, again, you're entering crazyville. It's like the concept of, of agony is bad. You can say that concept exists, but the platonic realm doesn't actually have an opinion. I don't know what he means by beyond me, like a god or something. The is demands the ought. So long as the is exists, i.e. suffering, then the ought follows. No one has to care if they exist. They still do. For instance, 98% of us ignores that we ought not to torture and kill animals and humans via meat eating and procreation, but they do it anyways. No one has to recognize value for it to exist. It exists. If an animal is dying, scared and alone, that suffering has value. Ask yourself to not offer any evidence refuting this. So this is where Ask Yourself becomes semi-religious. He's appealing to God. So because we cannot see this mythical ideal, platonic world where, where there is perfect value that one can hold in one's hand, then value does not exist. He said we've been culturally conditioned to no suffering. That is simply retarded. We are born with neurons and the capacity to feel immense pain. We are made to suffer. It's an intrinsic part of our existence. So he's saying that to believe in objective reality is quote-unquote crazy town, yet he's talking about some non-existent fairy tale realm where ideal forms exist. It's nonsense. So who's crazy here again? Okay, well I've heard this subjectivist bullshit a million times too. Okay, you're not original for being a relativist. I don't understand why people in 2018 are still talking about Plato's realm and ideal shapes. Aristotle already rejected it the generation after Plato first proposed it. The most important things Plato did were to record the words and ideas of Socrates and open the academy which gave us Aristotle. Aristotle realized that reality is where value comes from. Value does not exist by itself, that is true. Just in the same way that the color red does not exist without a red object, value exists because neurons exist. You know, Ask Yourself keeps trying to say that we have to admit that value doesn't exist because, uh, like, if no sentient existed. Well, obviously. So what? We don't live in a world where there is no sentience. That's what we desire as an end goal. Value came into existence around 600 million years ago with the evolution of the brain and the nervous system. All animals have them, and that's why we understand its value. We are all the same. Ask yourself needs to think more empirically, like Aristotle, and not get so caught up in metaethics and metaphysics. He's just making things more complex than they need to be. Observation comes first, always. Abstract reasoning, second. 
So ask yourself a saying that value does not exist in reality, but like beauty and justice, it only exists in our minds. This is simply not true. Beauty may be subjective, but value is not. Because suffering exists in every single sentient brain, it is written into the fabric of our DNA. Where brains exist, suffering exists. To say that suffering and therefore value are abstract concepts is the same as saying that brains and nervous systems are abstract concepts. They are not. Reality is. Suffering is reality. The is implies the ought. A sentient mind in distress requires comfort. And if you do not provide the comfort, then that is the same as hurting yourself. It's illogical. Without this understanding, we would not have science. What Ask Yourself is doing is giving himself an escape hatch so that he can ignore the truth. You don't want to face the reality that life is a negative, so you have to give yourself a way out, and that escape hatch is to deny that value is a real thing. This is when skepticism goes too far into flat earth territory. This is why it's ironic that Ask Yourself calls ethical realists religious when it is him who's doing the denying of reality. Utilitarians do not even need metaethics. We know that observation comes first. We observe nature, we observe torture, mutilation, and death. We call this bad because it is bad. So long as one brain exists in the universe, bad exists. Pain, suffering, discomfort, these are not comparable to Plato's perfect circle. They are real and they have intrinsic value. It's you relativists and nihilists who are the religious nuts. You have the burden of proving your claim that pain has no value. I know for a fact that pain being experienced in a sentient brain has value. I know that because I've felt it. Because I have felt it, I know that pain experienced in another brain is also a negative. The existence of the negative implies an ought, as in something ought to be done about that. You really don't think that if you saw a suffering animal with its guts spill out all over the road, you should just walk on by and do nothing? I dare him to explain why I believe in magic, because I believe that suffering has value and implies a solution. A problem implies a solution. Suffering is a problem. If you don't understand that, then there's nothing e to even debate about. Reality is real. Value is real. Value implies ought. Uh, a guy named Danny Bork in Superhuman Dance's chat room said, People are sources of morals as stars are sources of light. Uh, I like that metaphor. That's exactly what I'm trying to communicate to ask yourself. If you value just um, reducing suffering, then even if something comes with a massive, ginormous benefit in terms of well-being, if it causes just the slightest bit of suffering, you know, like a, a pinprick, you have to say no to it. So those both seem absurd. So it seems to me like the best form of consequentialism is saying that you care about the ratio. So, a, okay, we talk about, for example, someone commits rape. A rapist commits rape, and the rapist gains more pleasure than the victim. The victim is drugged. The victim doesn't even know that it happened. The rapist has a tiny pecker. It doesn't, uh, you know, hurt her or anything. Uh, that you'd have to ultimately say that that is actually a moral positive. It maximized well-being. Um, now, you could do the same thing with organ theft. Um, you could say, you know, if killing one person against their will and harvesting their organs maximizes well-being for... People go to five people, but really you could just say it maximizes well-being for one other person, and the, the total amount of well-being is greater there. Now, the consequentialist response to this is deeply unsatisfying. What they will tell you is that there's the problems with those things are not something about those actions themselves. It's the fact it's it, the problem can be located in the externalities or the pragmatic consequences of allowing these things to happen. Now that's true. I mean it's true that if you have a world where for example you allow rape that a lot of people are going to be pretty unhappy and live in fear. If you allow organ theft, same thing, or, you know, whatever else you want to go to. So, I agree, but that still does not satisfy me personally. I won't bite the bullet on that system at that point, because they still can't deal with any of these situations once you say it's in a vacuum. There is a famous short story by Ursula K. Le Guin, where a city has an Eden-like existence with plenty of food and comfort for all. It's a utopia. But all of this pleasure, or well-being as he would call it, is at the expense of a child who is kept in a dark cell with no comfort at all. He's beaten, starved, and completely unloved. And what Ask Yourself is saying is that this is fine because there's so much well-being 
You know, I mean, it's insulting for him to compare the the one suffering against a great amount of pleasure um, as inconsequential. It's fucking bullshit. Because a large number have their comfort. It's okay for one person to suffer. So he would not walk away from Omelas because the one child suffering for a metropolis of comfort is the pinprick. And the pinprick is totally worth it. While Le Guin's whole point of the story is that Ask Yourself's position is illogical and unethical. Someone with integrity would not only walk away from Omelas, they would come back with an army if necessary to rescue the child. This is because suffering is the only thing of value in the universe. A full belly has no value. Only the painful sensation of hunger does. Eating a meal is only good because it fixes some pain. Clearly the suffering reduced by a cancer cure trumps a mild discomfort of a pinprick. That's what we are saying. There is no well-being to even consider. The organ harvesting critique has also been debunked. Um, it would be wrong to kill an otherwise healthy person to donate all of his organs for the benefit of several others because the consequences of such an act would have negative utility. No one would go to doctors anymore if they thought they might never come out in one piece. The entire profession would collapse. He then acknowledges the response I just gave, actually, uh, anticipating it. And his answer for that is that for philosophy to be true, it must be true in Plato's realm of ideal shapes, or as he calls it, a vacuum. Yet he does not prove or give any evidence for why we would do philosophy in heaven or some other reality than our reality. You don't practice ethics in a vacuum. We need ethics here on Earth. So it's him, not me, who's in search for some kind of God-given perfect morality. He's getting the most basic fact wrong, that we live in reality. Aristotle realized this over 2,000 years ago. Why is Ask Yourself constantly referring to Plato instead? So he uses the tired, anti-utilitarian argument that is a large group of men in a gang rape and an unconscious woman, uh, saying that we would have to say that's ethical because multiple people receive pleasure while the woman doesn't even realize she's being violated. Uh, here's the question you should be asking. Not who gets the most well-being, but does this act reduce suffering, yes or no? You could stupidly say yes, because the men have pent up sexual urges that are satisfied for perhaps 12 hours. So the act has limited utility as the pleasure is brief. The main fact is that they could just masturbate or have consensual sex instead. Uh, these are fairly easy options. Their act does not relieve any suffering for the victim. If she was asked before being drugged would she like to be gang raped, the answer would most likely be no. We know that most people do not want to be raped even if they don't remember it. I mean, I can go on and on with this. I mean, he's basically making the argument, um, you know, that if you put a pig to sleep, you know, with anesthesia and then slaughter it, that would be totally fine because the meat eaters would get pleasure from it. Maximizing well-being with sexual gratification, eating, defecating, sleeping, drugs, does nothing to prevent real suffering. As far as sexual gratification goes, the act is not the same as killing an animal if you are starving. You can go your entire life without sex and not have it be a significant harm. So then he goes on to critique deontology. Um, I'm not a deontologist, so maybe cantinatalists would be better at responding to this. Um, I will talk about deontology a little bit later in the video. Now, um, a line for deontology, a line for consequentialism, and the deontology line is on top until a certain point. And obviously the, the x-axis would be the, the suffering, the well-being trade-off of the action in question. Uh, so then, once you hit that point, you swap over to consequentialism. So, personally, I think the answer is probably going to be a polyaxiomatic system. And I would also point out that any kind of rule consequentialism that doesn't bootstrap the rule out of a concern for well-being uh, is basically just a polyaxiomatic system. Do we want to base our veganism on a specific meta-ethic? I would actually argue no. I think that we want to look at what all of the meta-ethical systems have in common, and then base our argument for veganism on that. So when you look at all the uh, moral systems, we are not going to opt for a system that does not comport with the laws of logic. Because if it doesn't comport with the laws of logic, you can justify anything. It's not even really a system in any meaningful way. So what he is promoting uh, with this dual chart is called dual morality, uh, choosing one theory of ethics where it suits him and another theory for other applications. This is the opposite of integrity. Uh, so judging from this video, Ask Yourself seems to be a meta-ethical subjectivist. And as far as normative ethics goes, he's not committed to utilitarianism or Kantianism. 
um, but recommend some kind of dual system of consequentialism and deontology, uh, essentially classical utilitarianism and Kantianism. Even though, in my opinion, both of these ethical systems are illogical and opposed to each other. You do not need a dual system. Negative utilitarianism is all that is required. Most of the arguments he makes on his channel, whether or not he realizes it, are negative utilitarian. For instance, he realizes that the imprisonment, torture, and murder of a cow to create 2,000 hamburgers is wrong, even though that flesh will create momentary taste pleasure and removal of hunger for a great number of humans. He can make the simple deduction that it's still not ethical because suffering is the only measure of value, not pleasure. They could easily eat a lentil burger instead and spare the sentient cow of deprivation, slavery, and murder. You know, he's just overthinking things like Hegel and others have done in the past. I don't know if he's a full nihilist, um, as it would be surprising to have a nihilist in favor of animal rights, but he's definitely an ethical subjectivist and anti-realist. Maybe he's into an ideal observer theory where what is right is determined by a hypothetical ideal observer in a vacuum. That seems to be where he's going here. Um, but the fact that he rejects reality as the basis for ethics makes him more like a theist, as theists also reject observed reality in favor of fairy tale dimensions with gods and magic. Uh, so whether he is an anti-realist, subjectivist, nihilist, or just a skeptic, uh, it all fits under the umbrella of irrationality. Because he has no solid foundation of ethics, when it comes to subjects like antinatalism, Ask Yourself cannot formulate a coherent response. A polyaxiomatic system that he proposes would actually violate the laws of logic he mentions. I believe he's talking about Aristotle's three laws of logic, one of which is the law of non-contradiction. This could also be called the law of integrity. By choosing the two different opposing systems, he violates the law right there. Deontology and consequentialism will give you different answers to ethical dilemmas. Ask yourself really has to decide if he's going to go with Aristotle or Plato, Mill or Kant. It shows a lack of integrity on his part to reject objective ethics. He must use normative ethics, and accept the fact that value exists for him to even have such an opinion. And ethics are not a matter of opinion, they're a matter of fact. 23-month-old Alfie Evans passed away in a British hospital on Saturday. While the official cause of death was a degenerative brain disease, Alfie may have been murdered by the British health system and the British High Court. Doctors at the hospital treating Alfie decided to remove his life support against the wishes of Alfie's parents. The High Court not only upheld the doctor's authority to override the parents' wishes, it refused to allow the parents to take Alfie abroad for treatment. I subscribe to retired congressman, physician, and former presidential candidate Ron Paul because I'm into the anti-war movement. Uh, like him or not, if you spend any time on antiwar.com or other anti-war sites, you'll find his articles there on a regular basis. He usually and wisely does not go on rants like this on his channel. Uh, it's usually in the interview talk show format. But this one was a doozy, and it just reminds me that even though he is anti-war, he is certifiably insane, or at least insanely deluded. So like he said, the subject here are these two malicious breeders from England, Tom Evans and Kate James. These two geniuses uh, both appear to be carrying a recessive gene that when combined uh, in their offspring, cause a disorder similar to leukodystrophy, or white matter disease. It's a degenerative disease like multiple sclerosis uh, that destroys the myelin, the brain's white matter. Myelin is like the coating on an electrical wire and it protects and shields it. Without this substance, the brain essentially melts inside the skull. So this child was not murdered by the government. The child was dead. The parents are the ones who committed the murder when they created him. The only thing his brain was able to do was cause seizures in an otherwise lifeless body. The doctors who were caring for him realized that there was no hope. Bringing him back would be no less difficult than reanimating a corpse. The brain had collapsed and what was left was just fluid. But these breeders were sickeningly obsessed with playing with a dead body. I mean, it's not that far from necrophilia. I mean, why are these criminals not in prison? Uh, sadly, these yokels got a lot of support from uh, people like Ron Paul and, of course, one of the craziest of them all, the Bishop of Rome. Catholic Italy granted the parents and the dead infant citizenship in hope that they would somehow take this brain-dead child all the way from England to Italy so they could play with his body some more and maybe perform some pointless and disgusting experiments on him. Ever since Plato, supporters of big government have sought to put government in charge of raising children. 
The authoritarianism of the system where experts can override parents is underscored by a police warning that they were monitoring social media posts regarding Alfie. Alfie's case is not just an example of the dangers of allowing government to usurp parental authority or the failure of socialized medicine. It shows the logical result of the widespread acceptance of the idea that rights are mere privileges bestowed by government. Widespread acceptance of natural rights and the principle of non-aggression that flows from natural rights is key to obtaining and maintaining a free society. Thus, educating people in the benefits of free markets, individual liberty, and a foreign policy of peace and free trade is key to protecting future Elfie Evanses and other victims of the welfare warfare state, as well as to restoring respect for the moral principles of liberty among the critical mass of the people. <laughs> so the controversy, according to Paul, um, is that it was the state and not the parents who decided to pull the plug. This is a problem for him. Uh, you know, the government in England, just like here in the U.S., is supposed to represent the people. We're Republican democracies. And rational people should realize that these two fuckers are insane religious fanatics, and therefore this decision cannot be theirs to make anymore. Um, Paul is saying that a breeder can harm and abuse their children even after they've caused irreparable brain damage. The Pope agrees, of course, because uh, to him it's not these idiots with functioning genitals who made this happen. It was God, and apparently... God doesn't make mistakes. He makes little miracles. Witness God's miracle. Yeah, you know, I mean, it just it goes without saying, religious beliefs cannot be respected in the modern world. I mean, they have to be called what they are, totally and completely batshit crazy. I mean, the Pope should be ignored. He should not be allowed to set foot on American or British soil. He should never be visited or mentioned by our elected officials. He can make his ludicrous proclamations from his fortress in Rome, but if nobody listens, he will not have power. He'll just pander to a smaller and smaller base of believers in backwater countries like Brazil. You know, as for these two criminal child killers, they should be in prison, but most likely they'll try this again because no one can legally stop them. You know, Dr. Paul is showing a distinct lack of integrity here. His whole platform is for individual freedom and human rights. Yet here he is arguing that two sadists should be allowed to torture a child indefinitely. This is what theism and deontology does to reason. It completely destroys it. You cannot think rationally if your ethics are based on ancient fairy tales. Religious beliefs can be seen as one of the greatest causes of the loss of integrity. One of Ron Paul's favorite thinkers is the economist and philosopher Ludwig von Mises, who was a utilitarian and an atheist. So Paul just picks and chooses what he wants to believe, meanwhile ignoring the facts uh, that contradict his religious credulity. Uh, you may have heard the saying, your right to swing your arms ends where another man's nose begins. That is the problem with Paul's natural rights theory. When your right not to use birth control causes a child to be tortured, then you did not deserve that right. Paul is concerned about the liberty of the torturers and killers, and not about the liberty of the victim to die with dignity. It's disgusting. Rule-based ethics often ends in contradictions and confusion. Deontological libertarians use this non-aggression principle when it suits them, not when it results in the best utility for all. For instance, Paul does not include animals uh, or the unborn in his theory of rights. Utility always trumps rights. For instance, animals cannot agree to a contract, therefore we have to transcend the boundaries of social contract theory. Side note! All hands on the table. I'm not a vegan. Um, I'm not a vegetarian. I eat mostly fish and very little chicken. I try very hard to get my chicken from level three non-factory farming places. I'm not perfect. I do. I try and I do what I can. Um, Anti-natalists, even if we aren't vegan, we're still kind of on the same side, okay? We're still reducing our carbon footprint. We're still not adding to the demand. We're, we're still doing the best and the most that we can as far as reducing our carbon footprint. Superhuman Dance put it well when he said that to be an antinatalist who supports the meat, dairy, and egg industries, it's kind of the same as being a vegan who procreates. I mean, you're really not on board with antinatalist philosophy. So he was kind of saying that the friendly antinatalist might be, should maybe call herself the friendly child freest. When you buy products that are made from animals or that are tested on animals, you are supporting birth kidnapping, rape, murder, torture, and exploitation against sentient beings as well as unnecessary environmental destruction and harm to your own body. 
You know, she mentions that she's not even a, veg a vegetarian, but that doesn't really matter because there is nothing ethical about vegetarianism, as they eat eggs and dairy, uh, two of the cruelest industries. It just really irritates me and irks me when there are certain posts that go up where it's just vegans. It almost just seems like they're just stirring the pot. Like they're just trying to start shit, not really to get anywhere or to be helpful in any way. It's, it's just one of those reasons that vegans have a bad name and they have a PR problem. Um, so anyway, enough of that. Let's get to the clip and we'll talk about that for a few and y'all can uh, let me know what you think. But for me personally, when we went vegan, I have, I have four children. My wife, we lived in the mountains of New Mexico, barbecue and hunting country. Uh, basically, we just did it for ethical reasons, but I mean, we started discovering, oh, there's... <laughs> not one, not two, but four fucking kids. <laughs> and then, and then, he had the nerve to be like, if you to talk about, oh, electric cars are good, or shorter showers are good, but if you really want to save the environment, then you need to go vegan, which is a bunch of bullshit. And then the vegans will keep trying to stir up shit on the anti list board, and y'all will keep doing yourselves no favors, and giving yourself bad publicity and PR, and reasons for people to spite veganism simply for the fact that they've had negative interactions with people who subscribe to veganism. So the friendly antinatalist is completely correct that having kids, especially four of them, uh, is the worst thing you can do as an environmentalist. Uh, I think this guy should have been booed off stage, personally, and told never to come back. You know, environmentalists, in my experience, uh, are huge deluded hypocrites. You know, they think they can just do whatever they want so long as they pay lip service to, like, a carbon tax. You know, a great example is Al Gore, who burns more natural gas heating his pool uh, than six homes use for indoor heating. Uh, the only reason I can see going to any of this Earth Day kind of crap is to promote antinatalism and veganism. Everything else is a joke by comparison. Why is postmodernism bad for antinatalism? Well, lots of reasons. The biggest threat, I think, hands down, that postmodernism uh, poses to antinatalism is its reluctance um, to accept science. It's hostile to science. It's um, denial of certain biological facts um, whenever those facts um, impede or supersede personal experience or personal feeling. Um, that is the other second major tenet of postmodernism that in and of itself um, is anti-intellectual. Um, a lot of people accuse postmodernism of being anti-intellectual. And that would be um, the privileging of generally personal experience or lived experience over um, objectified fact or empirical evidence. Um, so soon after, um, Friendly Antinatalist made a video about postmodernism, which kind of started some debate online, so I thought I'd address that. Um, as Poodle Susan pointed out in a recent video, uh, I think the Friendly Antinatalist is a little bit confused about postmodernism. Um, she seemed to equate postmodernism with nihilism. As Poodle Susan said, um, postmodernism is a movement less of a philosophy, kind of in the academic humanities, um, which includes art, literature, and culture. It's not a philosophy or a philosophical position. Um, it's, it's simply a re reaction to modernism. It's really not the same as nihilism, even though some postmodernist movements are nihilistic. When we talk of a philosophy that rejects reason, facts, evidence, value, and objective knowledge, that is nihilism. Postmodernism um, is more of like a re-examination of literature and art uh, by discarding previous theories. You know, so a good example might be um, this most recent Star Wars film that everyone hated, with good reason. Um, they decided to throw away all of the previous versions of these characters and kind of start over. So an optimistic and brave Jedi, Luke Skywalker, becomes a cowardly pessimist. Uh, a war that was previously won is now lost with no explanation. The story I referenced earlier, those who walk away from Omelas, uh, has often been described as postmodern because the narrator breaks with traditional storytelling and communicates directly to the reader, uh, breaking the fourth wall. So that's, I mean, that to me, that's a more correct use of the term. Um, I think she was trying to say that nihilists and subjectivists, like ask yourself, are a definite threat to antinatalism, and that's true. So postmodernism doesn't necessarily have to entail nihilism. I think you could still call any kind of new theory that comments on modernism, postmodern, 
is because it's such an arbitrary term. So in my opinion, we should not even be using this term um, in philosophy. We should really stick to concrete things that are well-defined, like nihilism, atheism, antinatalism, etc. Uh, so in summary, uh, buying animal products, it is a natalist activity. I don't think she should change her name to the child freest. I mean, she's an antinatalist, she gets the argument, but you want to be, you want to have um, integrity in your personal life, not just in your philosophy. Like, you can pay lip service to veganism, but if you're really going to promote antinatalism, you should be trying to live it the best you can in your own life and be consistent. You know, so an antinatalist carnist is showing a lack of integrity. The two positions contradict each other. The friendly antinatalist didn't offer any excuse, but I assume it's the oily, salty, taste addiction of flesh and bodily fluids. Uh, it's, it certainly cannot be the nutritional value because there is none. I'm going to leave a couple links below just in case the friendly antinatalist watches this video. Uh, one will be a link to Gary Yurofsky's The Best Speech You've Ever Heard, which has turned many millions of people vegan. And I'm going to include the movie that actually turned me vegan. Uh, when I watched this documentary, I, I have not eaten meat since then. This was about nine years ago. Uh, the documentary is called I Am an Animal, uh, The Ingrid Newkirk Story, uh, which is made by HBO Films. The word integrity can also be used to refer to people who act in ways that are consistent with their beliefs. So even if the friendly antinatalist has an intellectual understanding of why it is wrong to create new lives only to kill them for taste sensations, she should still be living that understanding. You know, one of my favorite YouTubers, that vegan couple, uh, always says, veganism isn't the most we can do, it's the least we can do. It's really not that difficult a lifestyle to lead. Although really, uh, there, that vegan couple is not correct. Um, the least we can do is remain child free because all one has to do is use birth control. I mean, when you do live the vegan lifestyle, you know, it requires vigilance and you have to read labels and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of a constant thing, but you know, once you just start to live that way, you'll never look back, you know? Like I, I have no interest in ever eating meat again. It's, it's fucking gross. Um, you know, I would really like to see all YouTube antinatalists have a united front of incorruptible integrity so no one, like, ask yourself, can attack us. I would like to say I also do give the friendly antinatalists a lot of credit for being honest with their audience. Honesty shows a lot of integrity. The ayahuasca is definitely not a drug. I was really against it for a long time because that's what I thought that it was. I really just thought that it was like LSD or psilocybin, which I'm not against those either, but I've never done a hallucinogen in my entire life. And ayahuasca is the strongest hallucinogen that there is. So I just wanted to kind of explain a little bit about that. For those of you that don't know what ayahuasca is, it's actually this really, really thick tea that is brewed from two different plants. So there's the chacuna leaf and the ayahuasca vine. And somehow the shamans, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, figured out how to make this tea to connect them to the spiritual world. I've heard that the plants actually showed them how to do it and told them to brew these two things together. So ayahuasca has in it DMT, which is dimethyltryptamine. Um, and if you've ever seen DMT, the spirit molecule, or you've ever heard anything about DMT, DMT is in everything. It's in our bodies, it's in plants, it's in food, it's in basically everything. And they say that it's the spirit molecule to the spirit world and where we came from. So ayahuasca isn't a drug, which is what I thought it was for a really long time. It's actually the strongest plant medicine you could possibly ever take. And how it works is you drink the tea and you have to do this in a very sacred space. So you're with a shaman who has been taught to do this over many, many years. They've Okay, now for our final response video, we're going to be looking at High Carb Hannah. I don't subscribe to her, but my wife does. Um, she was watching this video last week. And I think it deserves a comment. You know, I can really only follow so many vegan lifestyle channels. There's so fucking many of them. Channels that don't deal specifically with ethics aren't as interesting to me. Especially someone like Hannah, who just tries to game the Google algorithm for views. You know, I mean, just look at her thumbnails. Boobs. Boobs. Ass shot. Boob shot and the always popular fat to thin videos, as all of her top videos are of this variety. But this last video showed that she is an idiot and her channel might be dangerous. I mean, she's recommending people go on a psychedelic trip to the jungle to find themselves. So she's really a, a lost soul looking for some guru or some drug to give her life fucking meaning. So the drug she took is called ayahuasca, and it's basically a longer lasting form of the psychedelic drug DMT. 
which is usually smoked in the U.S. for a quick 10-minute trip. I've never taken DMT, but it seems to offer an intense LSD kind of experience. It may seem like harmless fun, but like with SSRI antidepressants, ayahuasca messes with serotonin, the neurotransmitter. Fucking with your brain's serotonin levels is usually a really bad idea. Um, serotonin syndrome is most likely to occur in people who are taking antidepressants when they also take DMT. This could be a dangerous combination. This occurs when your body builds up too much serotonin. You know, symptoms of serotonin uh, syndrome can, can include headache, disorientation, agitation, high blood pressure. Uh, it can actually be fatal as well. Um, other potentially dangerous risks associated with ayahuasca and DMT are seizures, uh, respiratory arrest, and coma. People who have pre-existing mental disorders like schizophrenia, um, there can be severe side effects. Um, there are incidents of people dying on these drug vacations. It's not an unknown occurrence. My question for Hannah is, why can't you just study philosophy and examine your life from the comfort of your own home? Why do you need a shaman in psychedelic drugs? Clearly she's lost and not sure what to do with herself. I mean, why else would she pay thousands of dollars to fly to a foreign country to do drugs? <laughs> I mean, does she expect all of her does she expect all of her half a million subscribers to go to Central America for a drug-induced religious ceremony? I mean, do you really think that's a good idea to make some mystery concoction of drugs by someone you don't even know? You know, promoting heavy drug use and religious healing, uh, it does not go well with the minimalist vegan lifestyle she otherwise promotes on her channel. So this entire video is just a long-winded description of a drug-induced delusion. The problem with reality-altering chemicals like DMT and LSD is that you change how your brain figures out reality. You know, it's just there's not enough bullshit in the way already. You can just tell from her language, blessings, rebirth, soul, healed heart, dark energy, etc. Um, now this was religious intoxication and nothing more. You know, it's like going to a Pentecostal snake handling service where everyone gets wound up in a religious f uh, fervor. It's like being high without drugs. Uh, studies have demonstrated uh, what Marx once proclaimed, that religion really is like an opiate. So if you want to be an effective vegan uh, activist, we really need you to be here on Earth, not up in the clouds high as a kite. I mean, this is New Age bullshit and nothing else. Before she said she felt lost, and now she feels so much love for the world. Ick. So the result of this experience has been to fill her head with selfish delusions. She never mentioned the plight of animals or activism at all in this video. I mean, you can't just take some drugs over a weekend and expect to be a better person. That takes time, effort, and actual fucking work. You know, magic mushrooms, uh, DMT, LSD, MDMA, some of them can be helpful in a clinical environment, you know, for people with severe mental illness, like PTSD and schizophrenia. Those people have nothing to lose. But for a perfectly healthy woman to take them in a religious environment, it's just mental masturbation, if even that. You know, like an egotistical, spiritual acid trip. Of course, many seekers of knowledge throughout history have used drugs looking for insight. William James used any drug he could get his hands on, uh, but most famously the dental analgesic nitrous oxide, which was the only way he said he could understand Hegel. <laughs> Schopenhauer called Hegel intellectual corruption and crazy mystifying nonsense. It is not shocking that James' drug trips led to a more mystical beliefs. And so it happened with this YouTuber. If the knowledge you are gaining is mystical, unprovable mush like God or love, then you have gained nothing. You have lost the ability to think rationally. I have tried nitrous oxide, MDMA, and LSD before, and neither one helped me think any better. If anything, those experiences were setbacks. But I realize that this is just my anecdotal evidence. Uh, you know, in my life, all of my greatest understandings came from dead sober reasoning and reading. If the Bible makes more sense while on drugs, that probably means that the drugs are not helping you. <laughs> How the fuck is this any different than getting hammered drunk surrounded by buddies and family? You get all warm and fuzzy and feel so much love, yay! But she doesn't realize that the high wears off and then you need it again. She used a drug to get psyched up. That's really all this fucking is. You know, Aleister Crowley used to have spiritual experiences uh, with sadomasochistic sex in the middle of a desert. Go ahead and do it, uh, you know, it's your body, but you shouldn't be making videos uh, that are basically fucking advertisements for drug tourism. I mean, the link for this place is the first thing in the description in all of these videos she made about it, so I don't think it's far-fetched to say that she got some kind of kickback for these videos. Honestly, the reason I'm commenting on this video at all is because of a comment she made 